The following Connecticut Experience presentation is part of the ongoing partnership between the Connecticut Humanities Council and Connecticut Public Television. Together, we're exploring Connecticut's rich history and culture. Connecticut, like the rest of America, has struggled with the reality of crime and how it should be punished. Over the centuries, our definitions of criminal behavior have changed and changed again. So have our assumptions about the purposes and forms of punishment. Is our goal retribution or rehabilitation? Should we attempt to change the behavior of offenders or simply try to protect society by removing them from the community? Does our criminal justice system treat all citizens equally? Early Connecticut faced these questions too. For half a century, Connecticut locked up its convicts in Newgate Prison, an abandoned copper mine converted to a prison in 1773. In the rise and fall of Newgate, which closed in 1828, we can see the same critical issues of crime and punishment that we still grapple with today. The history of crime and punishment in the period before and including Newgate is really instructive. One of the things we can see clearly by looking at the shift from Puritan punishment to Yankee punishment and then to American punishment is the fact that our treatment of crime changes over time and that our values about what constitutes illegal behavior have changed over time. Looking at that through the prism of the past gives us a very fresh perspective when we look at the present and think about the future. Connecticut's early settlers left England to establish a city on a hill, a godly society that would be an example to mankind but they soon found that they had not escaped the reality of crime or the necessity of punishment. You have to keep in mind that what Connecticut settlers were trying to do was to establish a Bible commonwealth. They wanted to establish a society in which uh, the, both the civil and the ecclesiastical rules were drawn from the Bible. These people were Calvinists, and as Calvinists they believed that everyone was born a sinner. You were born a sinner, you had to have those natural evil tendencies beaten out of you as a child. When Puritans decided punishing children was necessary, it followed the idea that children were born filled with original sin, that children who committed crimes needed to be punished, in part to save their souls. They had to learn to live God's way. And this didn't apply only to children, this applied to adults. And adults who behaved in an ungodly way had to be punished. The punishment was supposed to make sure that the criminal repented and did not commit the crime again. Punishment was largely designed to humiliate and shame. Uh, these people who had broken God's rule and broken the civil laws had to be punished as a matter of uh, social preservation. You couldn't have these sinners living in your society. They would contaminate the whole of society. God would not believe that these people had done their job if they didn't punish them. They had to be ashamed, they had to be humiliated, they had to be physically hurt, they had to be ostracized, they had to be dealt with in, in order to fulfill God's law. Many crimes and their punishments were taken directly from the Bible. When the Puritans established their law codes, they looked to the Bible for sources. And of course, uh, prescriptions from the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, 
Well, if you committed adultery in colonial Connecticut, the law said you could be put to death. The Ten Commandments say, honor your father and your mother. Well, if you were a child and didn't honor your father, you could theoretically be put to death for it. Connecticut's first legal code in 1650 established 17 capital crimes that could be punished by death. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, such a son shall be put to death. There were a number of crimes that were specific to children. Breaking Sabbath was one of the most common because children always wanted to play and it was against the law to do anything frivolous on the Sabbath. The Puritans passed laws that were uh, based on biblical proscriptions because of course for Puritans man's law was just an extension of God's law. It was a way of enforcing God's law in the world. So Puritans passed laws that said a disobedient child will be put to death, uh, an adulterer will be hanged, when in fact in Connecticut colony uh, no children were ever put to death, no adulterers were hanged, and in fact except for witchcraft, no one was ever uh, executed for any crime during the colonial period. So why did they pass these onerous, really harsh penalties? Well, part of it was to warn people away from the sin, to warn people away from the crime. It is true that no child was ever executed for disobeying their parents, but I bet children by the thousands heard about it. Then there was that most heinous crime of all, compacting with the devil, witchcraft, which was punishable by death, and Connecticut enforced that law frequently. Connecticut was the first colony in New England to execute a witch, uh, a woman named Alice Young, who uh, was from Windsor and was executed in 1647. Between then and 1663, Connecticut executed another 10 people for witchcraft. This was a crime that they truly feared. Almost all of these people were women, and most of them were women 40 years or older. Uh, many of them tended to be outspoken, maybe cantankerous members of their community. Uh, some of them were healers. One person has argued that a very likely uh, suspect for witchcraft accusations was a woman who, because she had become a widow uh, and stood to inherit money and didn't have uh, brothers or other male relatives to look out for her, such women on the verge of gaining real independence and authority were frequent targets. Puritan law prescribed not only death, but pain, mutilation, and public shaming. Many of the most effective punishments that Puritan society had involved public shame. And so instead of finding execution as a penalty, you'll find things like public whippings, or in some cases having to stand in the church with a dunce cap on. That was considered a very serious and shameful punishment. If any person shall commit burglary by breaking into any dwelling house, or shall rob any person in the field or highways, he shall, for the first offense, be branded on the forehead with the letter B. The second time he shall be branded as before, and also be severely whipped. The third time he shall be put to death as incorrigible. If committed on the Lord's Day, besides the former punishments, he shall, for the first offense, have one of his ears cut off, and for the second offense, he shall lose his other ear. Adulterers were sometimes made to wear an A, a public sign of both their sin and their shame. A law from 1672 defined the penalty for adultery. Adultery. Both of them shall be burned on the forehead with the letter A on a hot iron, and each of them shall wear a halter about their necks so that it may be visible, and as often as either of them shall be found without their halters, they shall be whipped. In these small Puritan towns, where everyone knew each other, and where, where one's connection to family, friends, and one's status in the community was so important, 
public shame was an immensely powerful uh, form of uh, form of punishment. In Connecticut, as throughout colonial America, those subjected to these punishments were mostly drawn from the colony's poor. People of the better sort, that is people who were educated or wealthy, did not suffer the harsher punishments. They were more susceptible to the shaming that minor punishments would include. One punishment was almost unknown in Connecticut and the rest of the colonies long terms of imprisonment. Originally, uh, the colony didn't have jails. In the early 1700s, the Connecticut General Court uh, ordered each county to build a jail. Connecticut's early jails were essentially places to hold people until they went up for trial. They weren't considered places to punish people uh, the way we often think of jails today. As the first generation of Puritan settlers passed away, Connecticut life and values began to change. As Puritans became more interested in making money and acquiring land and becoming successful, the laws paid more attention to crimes against property and less to crimes against public order. The code, as always, uh, reflects society. Important thing, of course, is not so much what laws are written, but which laws are enforced. Most of the crimes that you find ending up in the courts are crimes against property. Uh, about two-thirds of the crimes that you see in court are debt cases. Reverend William Russell lamented this shift of values in 1730. The concern is not, as heretofore, to accommodate themselves to the worship of God, but where they can have most land and be under best advantages to get money. By the 1700s, Connecticut was rapidly changing from a religious to a commercial society. Historians refer to this change as the shift from Puritan to Yankee. It led to significant changes in the way crime was punished. One of the ways we see this shift from Puritan law to Yankee law is through the Criminal Code of 1750, which effectively took out the biblical references that had been found in the earlier law code and made, uh, made crime an essentially secular endeavor. Part of the change came from recognizing that the shaming punishments were no longer working. And frankly, the goal became in a more diverse society not to shame criminals into being good citizens, but punish them into being good citizens. And if you can't coerce them into being good in the community, get them out of the community. And now the idea of the longer jail sentence, the incarceration, began to become a formidable part of the state's legal arsenal. The decline of Puritanism certainly didn't mean that uh, physical punishments and public punishments ended right away. In fact, uh, they intensified as there were more charges of uh, crimes against property, the physical punishments became more common. Uh, two men accused of uh, burglarizing a house in Windsor in the 1760s were sentenced to uh, be whipped to have their ears cut off and to be branded with a bee. The current reported that uh, one of them bled so much that his life was in danger. Fines emerged as an option to physical punishments. Fines were, throughout the colonial period, uh, part of the punishment process. One of the uh, options a prisoner often had was to pay fines or to be whipped. And of course, this is something that at least physically favored uh, people of a higher status because if you had money, you could pay the fine. In 1773, shortly before the American Revolution, the Connecticut General Assembly established a committee to consider legislation for a novel idea, using confinement and the loss of liberty instead of whippings, brandings, and mutilations as the preferred way to punish criminals. Many ideas influenced the committee's choice to use long-term incarceration to punish crime. To accomplish their goal, 
the committee recommended using a closed copper mine in Simsbury for this new experiment, a prison. Confining, securing, and profitably employing such criminals and delinquents as may be committed to them. Newgate had its origins during the American Revolution, and the American revolutionaries uh, fought for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But someone who broke the laws, who did not fit into the New Republic, lost their freedom, and this thus became a, a punishment. Putting people in Newgate, in a sense, deprived them of their personal liberty at a time when Americans are intensely concerned about this idea of freedom and liberty and the rights of the individual. But people who kept prisons in this period made the argument very clearly that liberty without discipline uh, is not liberty at all. And prisons were a place where people could learn through work and through effort how to develop the, the disciplined skills that would allow them to practice their liberty in society. During this period, a new humanitarian sensibility spread throughout the Western world. Newgate Prison represents a, a whole new idea in the way people were to be reformed. The idea during the revolution, the, the American Enlightenment, was that people's character was changeable. It was, uh, could be reformed. It was, it was malleable. If they could be isolated, from influences that had led them to go bad could then be reformed and rehabilitated. So rather than engage in infamous practices, the idea was if people were put behind bars, they could be reformed rather than brutalized. Some officials insisted that physical punishments continue in combination with long-term imprisonment. Newgate represented uh, a certain kind of punishment for crime. It coupled incarceration, being removed from society, with punishments that uh, clearly we see today as being uh, very severe. You could be uh, kept in irons, and you could be put in double irons if you were obstreperous. You could be lashed up to 10 lashes if you got out of line. The General Assembly Committee that proposed using the copper mine as a prison hoped to make the prisoners' labor in the mines pay for the cost of their incarceration. Newgate first opened as a prison in 1773. It was the first state prison in the colonies. Of course, uh, Connecticut Yankees being um, the way they are, they look to do this in the cheapest way possible. So they took this abandoned copper mine and converted it into a prison. And the prisoners were to uh, mine this copper down in a pit some 70 feet below the ground. And the hope was that not only would evildoers be reformed, but they would also pay their own way through working this copper. Legislators also believed using the underground copper mine as a prison would provide a secure place to hold prisoners and keep the community safe. When completed, it will, in our opinion, be next to impossible for any person to escape. When the prison opened, it was felt that it would be secure because the prisoners were kept underground. However, this arrangement did not deter the prisoners at all. They were always trying to escape. They were trying to dig their way out through abandoned tunnels. They were attempting to riot, especially in the nail shop where the prisoners had tools to make the nail. It gave them the opportunity to attack the guards with fire shovels and hammers. They also several times burned down the guardhouse as an attempt for them to escape. Newgate Prison was established to punish the economic crimes that so concerned Yankee Connecticut. Initially, only burglary, robbery, forgery, counterfeiting, and horse stealing were punished there. When the prison opened in 1773, the mine was entered through a single shaft. Other shafts were used to let in air and take out the copper ore. Eventually, a 12 by 15 foot lodging room was blasted into the mine with an iron trapdoor set in the opening. <laughs> 
Newgate Prison has to be seen to be believed. The prisoners were held in a pit beneath the ground in this former copper mine. They descended by a rope many dozens of feet beneath the ground. It was cold, it was damp. Tuberculosis became a major uh, problem. The conditions uh, were what one would have to call cruel and inhumane. It was very brutal conditions beneath the ground. For most of the time, we understand that the prisoners sleeping underground were unsupervised. Therefore, they were free to frolic, to interact with each other, to plan mass escapes. And we know from the records that they did all those things. To spend a day there would be depressing, uh, but to spend several years there would drive you crazy, uh, it seems to me. But this was seen as a great humanitarian reform, a great step forward for the Enlightenment uh, to incarcerate people rather than cut off their ears. An engraving made by one prisoner may give an insight into the routine nature of physical punishments inside Newgate. One of the prominent features of a, an etching of Newgate Prison is a prisoner strapped to a whipping post in the middle of the yard. I think it's rather telling that in that etching uh, by Brunton around 18, 1799, 1802, that he shows all the other prisoners going about their business being completely indifferent to the fact that one of their own is being whipped. A prisoner could also be confined in solitary confinement in the mine. They would be chained in place and left deep underground and without any light and just restricted to a diet of bread and water. Throughout the history of Newgate, officials continued to try and profitably employ its prisoners. A workshop was established with five forges and the prisoners were brought up from where they slept underground in the mine tunnels at 4 a.m. in the summer and at 7 a.m. in the winter. And they were marched across the prison yard where they spent the day making nails. They were there for about 12 hours a day, and then they, after their meal, were sent back down the mine where they spent the night. One of the most uh, egregious uh, forms of work there was a, a treadmill, a large drum with uh, wooden steps on it that turned and through a series of uh, uh, levers was able to uh, crush grain. Prisoners on the treadmill reported that not only was there great physical fatigue, but the monotony of the work uh, produced emotional instability. The working conditions in the prison were virtual slave labor. Perhaps because of the forbidding conditions, many inmates actively resisting their incarceration frequently attempted to escape, often successfully. John Hinson, Newgate's first prisoner, escaped after only 18 days by climbing a rope lowered down the unsecured 70-foot ore shaft. Prison officials regularly wrote to the General Assembly about the lack of security. Your honors must have heard that the prisoners have all escaped that prison. They effected their escape by the help of evil-minded persons abroad before the necessary and proper securities could be completed. One of the most notorious early prisoners who was convicted and sentenced here was a gentleman named Richard Steele. He appears repeatedly in period newspapers describing his exploits as a great escaper from prisons and um, crimes he committed. He was actually sentenced to Newgate on three different occasions and escaped from here. Newspaper descriptions of him show that he was a repeat offender, that he had his, both of his ears cropped off, he was branded with a bee in his forehead. He actually told a judge when he was taken to trial in New Haven, he says, I became a criminal because I didn't want to work. Don't send me to Newgate. Why don't you just execute me and get it over with? The prisoners in Newgate would be mostly uh, farmers of limited means, men who were wandering, uh, what we might call homeless people, uh, beggars, young men who had gotten into difficult situations. There is no record of anybody of uh, upper status or substantial economic means who was put in prison at this time. It was definitely a class-based system of punishment. Uh, I suspect that uh, 
that's always been the case. Even today, we have, certainly we have our share of white collar criminals, but our prisons today tend to be packed with people who are uh, from socially marginal groups, socially disadvantaged groups. It does raise, I think, serious questions about uh, punishment and imprisonment as a means of social control and really uh, sometimes keeping people we don't like or trust out of the way. In the early days of Newgate, it was also used as a political prison. I think the fact that Newgate was established as a prison in 1773 is significant. Within two years of 1773, Connecticut is going to be involved in the American Revolution. And when you read the general court records at the time that they're talking about establishing Newgate, it is very clear that the colony is ramping up on a war footing. As the colonies moved toward independence, the General Assembly made support for British rule a crime. It turned out to be a rather convenient place in which to keep the Tories from engaging in activities that the Patriots felt might be difficult. So what they did is they took the Tories from many towns and put them in with the general population. I think it's not surprising that uh, Newgate became a place to house British loyalists, that this was, in effect, as much a political prison in its early years as it was a, uh, a prison for people who had broken the law. About 60 British loyalists, known as Tories, were eventually incarcerated in Newgate Prison. Higher ranking or more affluent Tories were most likely provided with alternatives to Newgate, such as lodging in private homes. Class difference mattered here as well. Among the troops who were kept here, uh, there was a clear difference between officers who were considered gentlemen and uh, the regular troops who often were considered, you know, the lowest of the low. Gentlemen may not have passed through the gates of Newgate that often uh, because they could be trusted on their honor uh, to be paroled to go home and not fight anymore against the, the colonists. In 1782, a fire, probably set by the inmates, destroyed the prison's wooden buildings. The prison was closed and the inmates transferred to Hartford Jail. In 1790, Newgate was reopened as a state prison by the new state of Connecticut. Legislators again attempted to make Newgate pay for itself through the labor of its prisoners. There was an ale shop that was built on the northern boundary of the property, and the prisoners would be taken up, and during the day, they would be kept busy manufacturing hand-wrought nails. They later expanded this further with making barrels, making wagons, making shoes, trying to exploit the limited skills of the prisoners. Unfortunately, things didn't turn out quite that way here at Newgate. It had nothing to do with the fact that what the prisoners were doing was not profitable. It had primarily to do with the fact that the administration here was constantly uh, corrupt and that the, um, the keeper and his assistants were always uh, skimming off profits um, so that uh, this, this place always would run at a loss. Changes in Connecticut's criminal code in 1821 greatly increased the crimes punishable by imprisonment. Newgate's population swelled to a peak of 127, and the prison expanded to meet the increased demand. In 1802, a stone wall was built around a large prison yard. At that time, it encompassed the guardhouse, a nail shop. Soon after, they added a chapel and what they called the upper prison, which was designed to be a cell block for prisoners. They built a hospital, they built a prison kitchen, and in 1824, they built the largest structure on the site, and the last building to be added to the site was a four-story cell block. The intent was that the prisoners could all be kept above ground in improved conditions. Beginning in 1824, women were sentenced to Newgate. 
Initially, there were no women at Newgate. There was a concern because there was no separate housing for women. At night, all of the prisoners went down into the vaults and mingled. After 1800, women began to be incarcerated at Newgate. They did prison jobs that related to the male prisoner population. They were the cooks and the laundresses. The number of women at Newgate was never very large and they were imprisoned in a separate building. They were not sent down into the vaults. Part of the reason for incarcerating women was that women also were whipped for crimes routinely. And the idea in a new republic, uh, in post-revolutionary America, of having women whipped in the public square at the pillory was a particularly degrading and brutal statement about the failure of democracy. Women put behind bars was a more appealing alternative. There were also problems at Newgate with the incarceration of male children. Children as young as the age of 11 are on the records for Newgate Prison. So they suffered the same incarceration. There was no differential sentencing. In 1815, a 14-year-old pleaded for clemency saying that he had never gotten instruction in religion or morals or letters. And he'd been told that Newgate Prison was not a good place to receive that education. There was no attempt to reform children, and the children lived in the night with the adult criminals. 20-year-old Wheeler Morgan complained later in life that the three years he spent for theft at Newgate in the 1790s set his footsteps on a path of crime. He spent every night, he said, in the company of forgers, adulterers, fornicators, counterfeiters, murderers, rapists, and he blamed his lifelong criminal career from that first three-year sentence to Newgate. A third or more of the prisoners were listed as Negro, Indian, or mulatto, even though these groups formed only a tiny proportion of Connecticut's population. One of the most famous prisoners at Newgate was an enslaved African known as Prince Mortimer. Prince was captured off the coast of Guinea in the early 1700s and spent the next 70 years as a slave in Middletown, Connecticut. In 1811, Prince was convicted of attempting to murder his master by placing arsenic in his master's chocolate drink. In actuality, his master, George Starr, never really drank any of the, of the uh, chocolate drink. Prince was convicted of attempting to murder his master and he was sentenced to life in prison here at Newgate Prison. What accounts for the length of Prince's conviction? Well, there can be very little doubt about the fact that um, since he was black, his sentence was probably considerably longer than would have been the case had he been a, a white person. What was clear in treating children under Connecticut law in the 19th century, and even earlier in the 18th century, was that children of color, poor children, Irish children, received harsher punishments than children of native-born Yankee Connecticut residents. This may have been part of the concern for public order. It may have been part of the concern that these people did not fit into society. But when looking at the punishments meted out, more often the harsh punishments went to black or Native American children or to Irish children. The establishment of Newgate Prison and the laws that authorized long prison sentences of 20 years to life began to replace physical punishment for prisoners. A report by Roger Sherman found whipping incompatible with decency and humanity. It recommended that whipping and the pillory be replaced by prison terms graded to the severity of the offense. Brutal whipping, branding, and ear cropping largely disappeared in Connecticut after 1790. As Newgate and the acceptance of long-term incarceration continued to grow, so did the criticism of the brutal conditions at the prison. The prison expansion in Newgate overwhelmed the prison that was already very problematic and the prison had become a great embarrassment by the 1820s. One of the things about Newgate, really, is that it represents, I believe, a failed experiment. Here it was in the transition between from going from corporal punishment to incarceration, and they 
couldn't seem to get away from the concept of corporal punishment. This presented the, the worst of both worlds to the prisoners. Travel writer Edward Kendall, who visited the prison early in the 19th century, wrote, I cannot get rid of the impression that without any extraordinary cruelty in its actual operation, there is something very like cruelty in the device and design. A humane visitor will call in question the rectitude of the persons by whom those inhabitants are placed there. As early as 1811, a report called Newgate an outrage upon humanity and a reproach to the state. In 1826, prison investigator Lewis Dwight wrote, I consider it on the whole the worst prison except one which I have found in traveling about 4,000 miles. In the 1820s, the General Assembly, meeting right here in this uh, elegant old state house, found that Newgate was disaster on many fronts. One, it didn't pay for itself, and frugal Connecticut legislators uh, didn't like that. They also felt Newgate was a, a school for crime and a scandal. Uh, there were frequent escapes. It was overcrowded. And the argument became clearly that the prison was, rather than rehabilitating uh, individuals, it was actually uh, encouraging people in a life of crime. Something had to be done. The result was by 1827, the legislators in the old state house passed a bill to create a new model prison, which became the Wethersfield State Prison that opened in 1828. The directors of the new prison wrote, it has been our earnest endeavor to substitute in the treatment of these men, so far as it should be practicable, the law of kindness for that of severity. Weathersfield Prison incorporated Newgate's concept of long-term incarceration, but unlike Newgate, it was designed to be a model institution based on the most advanced examples of the day. As legislators in the old state house realized that Newgate was a disaster and was not working at any level, they became enamored of a new system known as the Auburn system. And the idea was to isolate the prisoners, to keep them insulated from criminal influences in their background. Therefore, they were kept in a small cell in isolation with the Bible. Would then it was believed the prisoners would see their sin, see their wrongdoing, and then through rightful instruction, a beneficial environment, become rehabilitated, and thus crime would be ended. It was a very romantic idea. Of course, it didn't play out in reality. The end of Newgate Prison and the beginning of Wethersfield Prison represented broader currents rolling over Connecticut in the 1820s. The Asylum for the Deaf opened in 1817. The Hartford Retreat to cure the insane opened in 1824. People could be changed and saved from sin and crime. And there was also a series of religious revivals known as the Second Great Awakening, whose belief reflected this idea that people could really be changed. And this was the fundamental idea that Wethersfield tried to set up institutionally. The idea of a Bible in each prisoner's cell the idea of frequent religious services and isolation from criminal influences. When the state opened the prison in Wethersfield in 1828, it was a reflection of the recognition that reform was possible. Between 1828 and 1850, increasing petitions made it clear that reforming children in the company of adult criminals was not possible, leading to the opening of a state reform school for boys in 1853. Weathersfield initially was, was seen as uh, a panacea, as, as a utopian solution to the problem of crime, but very quickly, even starting in the 1830s, Weathersfield became overcrowded. The utopian hope that people would be rehabilitated by being isolated and given a Bible didn't work. The prison became increasingly overcrowded in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s with the influx of poor Irish who ended up disproportionately in the prison. The subsequent waves of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe in the beginning of the 20th century uh, also overwhelmed the prison. Weathersfield Prison was emblematic of punishment in Connecticut for the next 120 years, 
but in the end it too came under assault from critics as ineffective and inhumane. In 1963 it was closed and its inmates transferred to a new modern prison in Summers, Connecticut. Newgate Prison was closed nearly two centuries ago, but its legacy is still with us today. Newgate was very, very important in breaking new ground in penal reform. It was there, so we used it, but it had the effect of establishing incarceration as the principal mode of punishment. And when Newgate was given up, but we didn't give up the idea of incarceration, so Newgate uh, exemplifies this uh, penal reform, this change uh, from corporeal punishments to uh, incarceration, and it's uh, the first of these, and it begins a tradition that continues to this very day. Newgate, in short, introduced us to the modern world of prisons and incarceration, all the way to the supermax prisons that Connecticut has today. This is one of the things that we have wrestled with now for 200 years, 250 years, is what do you do with uh, criminals? Uh, do you try to reform them or do you merely punish them? The same questions Newgate's founders struggled with, what constitutes a crime and what purposes punishment should serve, still remain hotly debated today. We are a reflection of those attitudes, values, and beliefs that are going on around us. That's why you see the change. As communities change, as culture evolves, as communities and societies evolve, so does corrections. I think it's this dualistic issue that we struggle. It's uh, retribution, it's rehabilitation, it's a pendulum, it swings back and forth. Like when I began, we were more in a treatment mode. We were looking at um, different types of programs, specialized incarceration, um, to, to deal more with trying to uh, assist these, the individuals to um, re-enter society. Well, you know, one thing is for sure, elections have consequences. When I got to the legislature, people were focused on getting tough on crime and doing things about drugs and doing things about drunk driving and doing things about domestic violence and sexual abuse of children. And, and most importantly, the gun violence that was erupting uh, in all of our cities in the late 1980s. And so you put all that together and overlay the war on drugs, and it really shouldn't be a surprise that we have so many people in prison today. Those crimes that are violent, those are the crimes, those are the types of behaviors that society and the communities are not going to tolerate. You know, hurting other people, anything related to crimes against children and sex offenders. Um, you certainly see, again, the emphasis on drugs, and so I think that's where you see that it's the percentage of violence of offenders who are incarcerated that I think is reflective of what the communities are willing to accept. Uh, so, for instance, white-collar criminals may not pose a significant risk or physical threat to the community, and therefore they may be more appropriately handled in a community setting. The goals are retribution, to let the offender know that what they have done is not going to be acceptable. You also are going to deal with deterrence. You want citizens to know that if you commit uh, or violate the laws, there's a consequence to that. And therefore, by knowing what that consequence is, hopefully it deters you from committing any um, you know, unlawful acts. And of course, there's incapacitation. That basically is, is how do we take offenders who hurt other people and, and put them someplace where they can't hurt the public. I also see punishment as having a bigger role, and that is, is it reinforces what are acceptable behaviors and what are not acceptable behaviors. It's not just punishment as in the form of hurting somebody or like retaliation or vengeance, but it's really saying to the offender, we are going to reinforce what is acceptable behavior, and we are going to reinforce and let you know what is not acceptable behavior, what is unlawful behavior, and by punishing or incapacitating you or putting you in a prison environment or incarceration environment, we're really giving you an opportunity to change the way you look at things and how 
you behave and to influence your attitudes, values, and beliefs to be more successful in the community. Getting tough on crime and removing violent criminals from the street reflected yet another change in the purposes prisons were to serve. But gradually, a host of familiar problems emerged yet again to challenge the effectiveness of these solutions. Overcrowding, racial imbalances, skyrocketing costs, and the fear that prisons had become schools for crime led to yet another reappraisal of our approaches to punishment. The, the legislature has made a lot of changes over the last 25 years, and as a result, we've got about five times as many people in prison today as we had in 1980. We have more individuals in prison today than we've ever had in the history of, of, our, of correction or in, in, in the country. There's a over-representation of uh, people of color. African Americans comprise 46% of the prison population, but yet 9% of the state population. That's a problem. Getting tough on crime um, created all these initiatives to just house people in droves. One of the interesting and unfortunate outcomes of all of this stuff is that the criminal justice system, including the Department of Corrections, ends up being the social service provider of last resort. The percentage of inmates with severe mental illness in our prison system has been growing consistently for the past 10 years. It's up to around 20% of all the inmates, and in the women's prison, it's almost 50%. And, and one of the reasons for that is because persons with serious mental illness can't get treatment in the community. It's just not available. It's really quite political as well. Politicians have really built careers on that, just getting tough on crime, just saying that, you know what, we aren't going to tolerate this anymore. We're just going to put these people away. And so that's the reason that there isn't a lot of public outcry, because the people that are being arrested are already viewed as those that don't properly fit in society. They aren't contributors. They aren't, they aren't productive individuals. They're, um, they're a threat to your safety. I don't think these laws got passed because people wanted to be racists or wanted to be unfair or wanted to be ineffective or wanted to spend more money than we needed to spend. I think legislators thought it seemed like a good idea at the time. I mean, a lot of these things were relatively simplistic, right? There was no science behind them. It just seemed like a good idea. And, and people said, why not try it? But I think now we have the benefit of knowing what actually happened, right? Now we can go back and pick these things apart and see, did you get the results you wanted? When I got elected in 1986, there was 6,000 inmates. And in 1986, Connecticut spent $100 million a year to run its prison system. And in 1986, we spent $400 million a year to run our public higher education system. 10 years later, in 1996, there was 16,000 inmates. It had grown from 6,000 to 16,000 the budget had grown from $100 million a year for prisons to $400 million a year for prisons. And that same year, in 1996, we spent $395 million a year to run our entire public higher education system. I mean, we spend more money to run prisons in Connecticut than we do to run colleges. And I think when people hear that, they think it's crazy. And you know what? I think they're right. I think it is crazy. We need to hold people accountable. There's lots of ways to do that. Prison is just the most expensive way and, in many cases, the least effective way of doing it. And so if you want to bring the crime rate down, there's a list of things that will accomplish that goal. But putting everybody in prison is not on that list. The real question is, for all the money we spend to run prisons and for all the laws we passed, do we have an effect on the, the basic crime rate? It doesn't appear that we do. We have a lot of other effects, but the basic crime rate, the chances that you would be victimized, uh, are about the same today as they were before. The pendulum has begun to swing again, with a greater emphasis on rehabilitation in community settings for nonviolent offenders. Well, I think reform is essential, but it's also important to, to take a look at how you go about crafting a model that's going to work, because you can see that over time, obviously it hasn't. Some need to be incarcerated. Some need to be there and some need to ever, never see the streets again. But then you have a whole other group of people. First offenders, say, for instance, 
that I think if given the right support, these are the people that we need to focus on. They do deserve a chance. Prison is a breeding ground for crime. There are prisons and correctional facilities today where there's a good deal of education, rehabilitation, um, family counseling, anger management, and those, some might argue, are good things. But the other rule of thumb is that when an offender, particularly a juvenile offender, is locked up for any period of time, there's a great deal of learning that goes on that is antisocial learning. They learn how to commit crimes better. Our ideas about what constitutes a crime and how criminals should be punished have changed and changed again. No issue has been more important to us, and yet no issue has been more difficult to resolve. Most people in Connecticut, they certainly don't know about the last 300 years of corrections in Connecticut, and they also don't know about the last 30 years of corrections in Connecticut, and they should know about it, because I think if you, if you learn a little bit about it, it helps you understand how messed up things are today. Where we are today is the result of a long process, a process of reform and reaction, a process of techniques that worked and often didn't work. And a historical understanding gives us skepticism, it gives us humility, it requires us to keep an open mind about what we're doing and to look for ways not to repeat the mistakes of the past, to look for ways to continue to do better. We don't really know how effective what we're doing is. And ultimately, we have to be leery of, of good intentions because good intentions aren't enough without proper execution, good administration, and we should be skeptical of any, anything that's presented as a quick fix or, a, or an easy solution. As we try and figure out the impacts, the unintended consequences of the public policies we make in the legislature and what actually happens in the criminal courts and who ends up in jail and why, then we have to understand these things. When you come to a place like Newgate today, it's a park-like setting and, and you can look around and uh, see this beautiful scenery. It, it belies what it was in the 18th century. It was a starkly remote and removed uh, place of punishment. It reminds us that society has always looked at crime and the control of crime as an absolute necessity and that we've, we've, we've tried literally for centuries to come up with ways that help us balance the need for a civil society with punishing and trying to rehabilitate those who transgress the boundaries. When you go to Newgate and you walk through the tunnels there and you see the leg irons and the caverns that these people were incarcerated in, I think it provides an opportunity to really reflect on what punishment means and whether or not it worked then and whether or not the more modern day versions of Newgate work now. And it raises questions about what kind of society we wish to be remembered for. The idea of a cavern is particularly gloomy and horrible. And when we consider such a place as the abode of man, dark and dreary, excluding every ray of light and every object of nature, the mind is apt to recoil at the picture and to regard it as an outrage upon humanity.
production of CPTV Connecticut.